Only glimpses survived through the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, through church councils and the formation of parliaments. But a feudal system dominated European society for hundreds of years. It was not till the 17th and 18th centuries when writings by philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau influenced the modern forms of democracy. In 1690, John Locke wrote a book called Two Treaties of Government, in which the people and the government formed a social contract, and the government's job was to protect natural rights, which included the right to life, liberty, and the ownership of property. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau expanded on the idea with his book The Social Contract. Both Locke and Rousseau's books assumed the rights of the individual as they understood it from reading the ancient Greek texts. Their influence was prominent in the ideals of democratic reforms during the French and American revolutions. The first step in America's pursuit of democracy was the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain in 1776. This document, drafted by Thomas Jefferson, borrowed many ideals from Locke and Rousseau. In particular, the idea that all men are created equal. He altered the right to life, liberty and property to the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The revolution was significant to the colonisation of Australia as the British could no longer export their convicts to America and Australia became the new solution. Twelve years later, in 1788, under the leadership of Captain Arthur Phillip, the first fleet of convicts arrived here in Sydney Cove. Captain Phillip was the first governor of New South Wales and had complete control under British law. Life was tough on the new colony. Penalties were harsh and the conditions almost unbearable. Back in Australia, I met up with historian Dr John Hurst at the Brisbane Writers' Festival to find out what convict society would have been like. Convict society came out of Britain, which was the most advanced society in Europe in regard to representative government, certainly not democratic government. But there was voting. People, if you had the right amount of property and you were a man, you could vote for the House of Commons. So the king in England wasn't absolute and the king was not above the law. So the law and the judges were independent. Only parliament could pass laws and pass taxation. So though the society here looks pretty rough and ready, um, it nevertheless comes out of a society which respects law. So even in the early days at Sydney Cove, they, it wasn't run just as a military dictatorship. Uh, Governor Phillip is running the place according to the principles of English law. So a convict who re-offends isn't said, oh, well, he's, he's just some convict, we'll just hang him out of hand. There has to be a trial. He's presumed to be innocent. The, the case has to be beyond reasonable doubt. So this is why I'm fascinated by early New South Wales. Its, its punishments are, are, are harsh and cruel by our standards, and yet it's all being done by due process of law. And I think it was that attachment to law which meant this society could escape from its degraded origins fairly easily. It wasn't if we had to re-establish law when the convict presence begins to dwindle. The law had been there right through. This paved the way for reforms and in 1823 a council was formed to advise the governor. And by the 1840s many convicts had been freed and the colonies were putting pressure on the British government for self-rule. By 1852, the colonial councils of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania were told they could draw up their own constitution. And even though these new constitutions were set for self-rule, the reforms had not filtered through to the general public and became evident during the gold rush that followed. In 1854, a protest emerged amongst the diggers who felt that the administration by the commissioners and the issuing of licences was unjust. They formed a stockade demanded votes for all men, payment for members, and raised the rebel flag in resistance to British rule. The stockade was attacked by British soldiers and killed 30 diggers, which created the legend of the Eureka Stockade. Although not immediately evident, the Eureka Stockade was a physical test of the new constitution that promised each male one vote by secret ballot and without any property qualifications. The next major point in Australia's democratic history was federation. In 1901, the states combined to form the Federation of Australia. Australia was now a nation based on a national constitution signed here in Centennial Park, and Australia was seen as one of the most progressive democracies in the world. 
On arrival back in Sydney, I interviewed Associate Professor Helen Irving from Sydney University Law School about the Australian Constitution. Well, the Australian Constitution is democratic in parts <laughs> um, and democratic in its spirit, in its vibe, if you like, um, but um, still is it falls short on a number of, of measures. One has to look at the difference between the text of the Constitution and the constitutional conventions or practices which lie between the lines. A lot of the Australian Constitution is unwritten. Um, a lot of it is also written in rather sort of mystifying um, fictions which relate to British practice and British traditions which are not supposed to be written down because Britain has hasn't got a written constitution and so it's actually a little bit of a dog's breakfast when you look at it. Um, but there are some, we, we, can, we can certainly identify some clearly democratic provisions in the constitution and we can acknowledge that historically the constitution was state-of-the-art democratic constitution in its time. In 1901 it was, I think one can assert with confidence, the most democratic constitution in the world at the time. But just like ancient Greek democracy, certain groups were excluded from voting. The first Commonwealth Franchise Act enfranchised all white women around Australia. Um, New South Wales, in New South Wales, the Parliament at the same time in 1902 enfranchised its women. Um, uh, Queensland um, followed, I think, the following year, Tasmania as well, soon after. But Victoria was um, the, the state that lagged behind and its women didn't get the right to vote for state elections um, until 1908, although they'd been exercising the right to vote for Commonwealth elections for several years by then. All women gained the vote within a few years of Federation, but the Aboriginal people had to wait for over 60 years. In the 1890s, um, in the colonies, in four out of the six colonies, Aboriginal people were entitled to vote. Only two out of the six colonies, Western Australia and Queensland, had um, race-based disqualifications. And in Western Australia, uh, the racial disqualification could be overcome by a person holding property worth a certain level, of certain value. So, um, uh, conceivably, some Aboriginal people who were property holders uh, might have been qualified to vote in Western Australia, but across the board, pretty well, you're looking at a, um, a racial disqualification. Not just Aboriginal people, but coloured people generally. Same in Queensland. What this shows is the word democracy has a different interpretation for each society. When I interviewed Professor John Kilcullen from Macquarie University, one of the first questions I asked him was how democratic is Australia? To describe Britain as a democracy, or Australia as a democracy for that matter, is stretching the word a bit. It's got a monarchical uh, institution as, as the, one of the basic parts of its government. In fact, our system of government is a constitutional monarchy. The Queen is our head of state and represented by the Governor-General, and we have adopted the Westminster system, which consists of a Parliament with an upper and lower house. The Prime Minister is chosen by the party with a majority of seats in the lower house, which is also called the House of Representatives. Professor Kilcullen has a view on the democratic and undemocratic elements of this system of government. Well, um, the undemocratic aspects are fairly obvious. Federalism, the fact that um, um, there's a kind of two-level system so that people can't necessarily do uh, what they think should be done without coordination between different levels. That makes it hard to get anything changed. Um, I suggest that the division into geographical electorates is undemocratic because it means that, in effect, you need a special majority to get anything done. Um, the position of the Governor-General uh, the monarchy. The Constitution is also on its face very undemocratic when it comes to describing the executive government of the Commonwealth of Australia. If you read the Constitution, particularly the section on the executive, you would get the impression that the, that the Governor-General, acting as the Queen's representative, wielded virtually sort of unlimited um, autocratic power and um, that he could determine when elections were to be held, that he could appoint ministers at his pleasure, he could dismiss ministers at his pleasure, um, and that he could do all sorts of things which are in reality done by and necessarily done by the government who is accountable 
to the people through the fact that we have rep responsible government, the, the, the government sits in the parliament. The idea of that, of course, is that the, the ministers are accountable to the parliament and the, the parliament is account accountable to the people. What is democratic, I think, is the responsiveness of the parliamentary system um, to voter opinion through the backbench estimate of how their leaders are going in relation to public opinion. Um, it's like a sort of game that's being played. The, uh, the two leaders, or more than two perhaps, are in competition with one another for public attention and for public support. And the backbenchers know that their own fate depends on how successfully these two, their, their leaders play, you know. So they're full of advice and, uh, and try to, to influence the way the government's going or the way the opposition's going with varying degrees of success. But their ears are tuned all the time to what, what the public are wanting. So I think that that does give us something like um, what the, the Athenians had in their assembly. It's not the direct democracy that they had, but uh, it achieves something like a similar effect, I think. How far is our democracy different from the Greek democracy? Could our democracy actually be made more like the Greek democracy? Um, it is a sort of running critique of our democracy to remember Greek democracy because the involvement was so direct, participation on every important matter. And of course that worked in small Greek societies and you can see why it won't work today. Um, and so in, when I'm talking to students I explain, well, ours isn't a democracy like that. We have to call ours a representative democracy. And we also have to call it a liberal democracy because there are some things we want to secure even if the majority of people wanted them to be different. I don't think democracy does deal well with, um, with doing justice to a mon minority in a community. Now, in Australia, our problem is dealing fairly with the Aboriginals, you know. We just don't manage that. And the more democratic the institution of government becomes, the more overwhelming the um, influence of the majority becomes, the less um, chance there is of, of reconciliation with the Aboriginals unless the uh, majority are surprisingly enlightened, you know, unless they are uh, much more generous than, than they are proving to be at present time. Another thing that's not handled well are environmental issues, and this relates to the interests of future generations. You know, we're destroying the world uh, quite cheerfully um, and democracy is not going to put a stop to that because that would require all voters to accept that their consumption of fossil fuels had to be severely restricted and all other kinds of things like that, you know. And we wouldn't vote for that. Um, other things it doesn't deal well with are issues of war and peace because the, the foreigner that we're going to go to war with doesn't have a vote, you know. So um, you, don't, you don't necessarily get good decisions on vital matters like that. The environment, um, minorities, um, foreign relations, they're all very important. Well, I think broadly it's still working satisfactorily. I mean, we can all criticise aspects of it, but most people's experience of um, going to, a, uh, uh, to other countries um, where they don't have these freedoms makes them realise you know, what an advantage we have. I, I wish people were more uh, aware of that. It's not just solely by accident we, we have these uh, freedoms. They're, they're there because they were fought for chiefly in Britain. We inherited lots of the British victories for these uh, um, liberal rights. Um, and I often say to students who are so turned off politics, you know, would you like to live in a place where, you know, if you're rich, you can buy yourself uh, out of uh, uh, a crime? Or if you apply for a passport, you know, there has to be a hundred bucks for the man who's processing your passport. To have an honest civil service and an independent, honest judiciary, these are wonderful uh, achievements and we shouldn't... Um, talk too casually uh, about them. So I was involved in civics because, not because I thought the system was very bad now, but because so many young people in particular are turned off altogether about democracy. I thought they, they needed to 
um, understand it more and understand the way it is and, and, and what it preserves for them in the good life. But there is a worry about democracy. Political parties used to be an important part of it and now political parties struggle to get people to be interested in them. The political parties are sort of a rump of you know, minders and keen types, but they, neither of the big parties has, has, has a big base. This is not surprising when front page articles pop up in the media like this and turn people off the political process.